Hello, everybody. So, uh, I am Alexander Barth, and I will present here with uh, Charles Coupin uh, the tool that we're developing at the University of Liège called Diva. Um, so, I think it would be good uh, to have this, uh, this presentation as interactive as you want. And uh, I have uh, uh, two small kids in the, who are in the Y age. They're asking questions all the time. So I'm really used to get a lot of questions. And I always say to them, there are no stupid questions. They're just stupid answers. So, um, so what is Diva? So Diva is a data interpolation variation tool. So it is objective is to derive gridded climatologies from in situ data. So you have uh, several in situ, in situ data like ADC, like CTDs, ADCPs, uh, um, um, XPTs, Argo profiles. So you have uh, each of these uh, these devices gives you point measurements, and uh, for some application you want to derive a continuous interpolated field, which maybe represents the average state of the ocean. Okay, so Diva does this by um, by solving the uh, variational inverse method. So we are trying to develop uh, to derive a field which is close to the observations, yeah, and also at the same time it's spatially smooth. Okay, um, and there is a, a, a quite interesting analog that what was be used uh, um, before computer um, assisted design. This is called the Draftman spline. This was originally built for, uh, for shipbuilding and aircraft design. And so what you can see here is this kind of uh, Draftman spline where this engineer tries to, uh, tries to draw the wing of, a, of, a, of an airplane at Boeing. And of course, a, ring, uh, a wing should be smooth. And uh, so you want to have a smooth curve, which goes more or less to a set of control points. Yeah? And uh, before this was done with a kind of a, a rod that you, that you can see here on the table and a set of control points. So that's, that's what was used to, uh, to, uh, to, to draw smooth, um, uh, smooth wings and smooth uh, ship hulls at the time. Okay. And actually, Diva does uh, quite the same thing. So we're trying to derive a smooth curve, which more or less go through the uh, observations. Um, but we don't do it with a uh, with a rod or a plane. So we're doing doing it by uh, solving some equations in the computer, and they are uh, formalized via a cast function. And this cast function is essentially, essentially two terms. So the first term means that it should be close to the observations. So um, this is the location of the observations, x, uh, xj, and phi xj is the interpolated field at the, at the location of the observations, and it should be close to the, to the observations gj. Okay? We are squaring it because uh, um, being one degree more, one degree less is about, about the same. And, um, and there is a weight associated to every observation, which takes into account if the observations are, uh, how accurate the observations are. Okay. So this is the first term. So it's diva we have two things, close to the observations and smooth, spatially smooth. Close to observation is this first term, and the second term is spatially smooth. It's, uh, it's written in the term of a norm, and uh, it's not a usual norm, it's a norm which involves not also, not also the field itself, but also the gradient and the uh, Laplacian. This just means that you want it to be smooth. Okay. Um, so if you use software like Photoshop, sometimes you want to do something like edge, edge detection. Yeah. And uh, an edge detection is actually the same thing. It looks to the uh, to uh, to the uh, um, second derivative of the field, essentially the Laplacian. Okay. So. And, uh, and we, we want to have a, a smooth field which is, should have as, lead, as, as least as edge, edges as possible. So therefore, we want to minimize it. Okay. And so the essential parameters that we have seen here are the correlation length scale, L, and the weight that we're giving to the data. These are three parameters that we, we need to, to, uh, to determine. Okay. So here, I guess, it's a good moment to ask a question if you have one. <laughs> OK. 
Okay, so there are not a lot of equations here in this talk, just on this slide. But uh, I think it's it's quite likely that something is not clear if you are hearing, if you're hearing for the first time. So, but essentially, it's the same thing as the rod that we have before. It has to be smooth. Yeah. So the rod has some some rigidity, and it has to be close to the observations. Why do you think it doesn't have to be equal to the observations? Why, what do you think? Why we requiring that the interpolated field does not pass exactly to all these observations? So assume, huh, yeah, you, I see some, some people smiling that maybe already know the answer, but not, not, <laughs> not daring to say. Exactly, exactly. Observation can have errors. Exactly. That's, that's, uh, and, um, and this is, uh, and assume that you are, want to derive the mean temperature in the, uh, in the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah? And you have only point measurements at a given time, at a specific time. So you do not have any observations really truly a mean. You only have observations which are only valid at a given time. Okay? So you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot assume that a point measurement is exactly the same thing as a mean. They simply represent two different things. Yeah? And this is also sometimes called the representativity error. Okay? We are trying to derive a mean, but we don't have, um, we don't have actual uh, measurements um, of the mean itself. We only have point measurements. And then we might even have a time series. Yeah? So we want to... Uh, um, uh, derives the mean temperature for January in the Mediterranean Sea, and we have at a given location, at, a, at the surface, say, uh, 31 measurements, yeah, each for one for each day. Okay, so it's even impossible that we have a, uh, a interpolated field which goes through all these 31 measurements at the same time. Yeah, so it just has to be somewhere within the bulk of these measurements. Okay. And so, is this clear? Yeah? Okay, great. And so, what do you think what this L represents? The correlation length scale. Do you have some idea what, what should it represent in the ocean? Or say, um, um, well, there are, there are some, some physical uh, interpretation of that. Maybe this goes too far, but there are some uh, physical uh, justification that we see in the ocean. Most of the things happen at, at, at given length scales. Yeah? So uh, you see, you know, in the ocean, if you have some physical oceanography background, what makes the ocean special is that you have uh, stratification and you have the Coriolis effect. That's uh, that makes uh, geophysical fluid dynamics really special, that you have these both effects. And these both effects tend to be of similar size as the uh, Rossby radius of deformation. So there is a preferential length scale in the ocean where you have things like eddies, like uh, 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 meandering currents happen. Okay? So there are some length scales, preferential length scale in the ocean. And these are... Um, uh, and this can be captured by, by things like the correlation length scales. But if you are now interested in, uh, uh, in averages, then it should be probably longer length scale, which takes into account variation between uh, ocean basins, for instance. Yeah? Okay. Um, so who of you is maybe familiar with, uh, with ocean models? So somebody already, yeah, with one? Okay, sure. And uh, maybe data simulation? Okay, the same one. <laughs> uh, so maybe 3D VAR? 3D VAR, are you know, familiar with? You heard about it probably, or you're, you're using it? I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's about the same thing. So there's also, um, uh, in oceanography, there are also models being run to simulate the ocean. And they are uh, corrected using observations. And one of the methods that people are using is variational analysis, and which is about the same as uh, 
in the principle about the same as uh, as, uh, as what we have here in Deva. Um, but even simpler than this, if you think about linear regression, you have just a bit bunch of data points and you want to fit a line going through the uh, through the cloud of points. So that's exactly the same idea that we have here. Yeah? We want to fit a curve going through a bunch of, uh, of observations. Okay. So here's a very simple example. Assume that we have two, uh, two observations at this and this location. Yeah? Both observations have the value of 1, and, but have different uh, expected uh, uh, errors. Okay. So we assume that this observation is two times more precise than this one. And we have a correlation length scale of, of 0, 2. So if we're using this kind of, just these two observations in, uh, for, for Diva, we would have this kind of interpolated field. So the correlation length scale is essentially uh, a parameter which tells you how to spread information in space. Okay? So we have a just information here at this point, and we're spreading it spatially over a distance which is here 0.2. And for in situ data, this is really critical because uh, if you see a, a map of uh, uh, the coverage of in situ data, you will see that you have a lot of gaps. Yeah? There are some areas which are really rarely sampled, some areas were maybe never sampled. And so we have to uh, somehow uh, fill the gaps. So we have to spread the information spatially. Yeah? And this is exactly the uh, the role of this parameter is the correlation x scale, so spreading information spatially. Okay. Oops. And there is uh, some uh, properties of DIVA which makes it, uh, in our opinion, quite well suited for ocean application, and we are, in fact, a group of physical oceanographers. So um, this example shows the uh, surface salinity. Um, uh, in the Caribbean seas, and this plot was actually produced by, by ODV. And in, uh, you can interpolate uh, in situ observation also in ODV using a simple uh, gridding method or also with DIVA. And um, when you have uh, water bodies which are disconnected by, by uh, land mass, so typically you would expect that the water from either side of the land mass is not related. There should not. There is no reason that why they are related. Right? They're simply disconnected physically. Even if they are spatially close by, they are just disconnected. Okay. And so with simple interpolation methods, you can easily have that the uh, uh, that the low salinity of the Pacific influences the uh, uh, higher salinity of the Caribbean Sea, because they are they are uh, uh, geographically close but they are physically disconnected because of land mass. And in, in DIVA, this kind of decoupling is, is very natural. Yeah? To have, um, in essence, if you think again about this uh, uh, draftman spline analogy, we would have simply one spline on the uh, left side, on the, uh, 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 on the western side of the uh, Isthmus, and one of the eastern side. Okay? So there's just two, so just a, a draftman spline which is cut uh, in, uh, uh, in between. So they are simply disconnected. Okay. Another thing that is quite important in the ocean is, of course, ocean currents, which are, um, uh, um, which are advecting ocean properties around. And uh, so along a strong current, like here, the Gulf Stream, you expect that the ocean properties are quite similar. Right? And, um, and so we can, uh, we can take this ocean currents into account in Jiva so that the ocean properties are, are more similar along the ocean currents. Okay. Um, so do you have any other idea why there should be a preferential direction in the ocean when, when using uh, in situ data? Do you have some, any, other, any other ideas? Like, like the topography in the ocean, right? The topography in the ocean can also steer uh, the motion in the ocean. So sometimes we don't have uh, uh, measurements of uh, or, or maps of currents. Well, now we have now thanks to models. But but another way to use it uh, would be 
like the gradients of the topography, right? Um, so it's uh, uh, so large scale currents tend, in, in fact, to follow isopaths in the ocean, and uh, that's that's simply due uh, consequence of the of the Coriolis force. And another uh, quite important aspect is when you have a um, quite inhomogeneous coverage, as you usually do with in situ observations. Um, there are some transects where you have a lot of data, like here, that's a, a part of the uh, Provencal Basin in the Ligurian Sea. You have here a glider transect, you have a lot of data on this line here, and, uh, and also the uh, um, Gulf of Lions, you have a lot of data. So in this area, you suppose that your mean estimate is quite accurate uh, compared to other areas where you have a lot less data. So somehow you want to estimate how confident you are when you are estimating this, uh, uh, this climatological mean. And so in, in DIVA we have also ways to estimate the expected error variance of the analysis. Okay? And that's a quite a common theme in research, I think, uh, that every time you come to a given conclusion or a given result, it's always good to specify how confident you are in this result. So checking how, how accurate your, how sensitive your result is relative to maybe errors in your, in your input field, in your uh, inputs, or how sensitive the errors are in, the, in uh, relative to your assumptions. So I think this is a, uh, um, I see it. I see this trend also in other uh, disciplines. That it's always good to specify when you're doing some, uh, when you're coming to some conclusion, also to somehow specify the um, the degree of confidence. And that's what we do with uh, with these error variance estimations. And one of the um, reason why um, uh, Diva. It's also, uh, it's also applied in, uh, in projects like uh, uh, CData Cloud, CData Net, and Emonet. It's that uh, once, once you do uh, um, analysis with the uh, observations, so trying to estimate the mean climatologies, you fairly easily see uh, um, potential problems in the data. Uh, so if you have a couple of data points which are really far off and quite inconsistent with other observations, then, uh, uh, then it shows quite, uh, quite quickly in this kind of, uh, in this kind of analysis. Do you have any idea how would you proceed when you have a bunch of uh, uh, in situ observations? You make a, a climatology. What would be the next uh, steps in order to flag potentially bad, uh, uh, bad data? So assume that you have your, you have your in situ data. You have the temperature, say, at the, at the surface. You have, the, uh, you have now the gridded field provided by, by Diva or any other gridding tool. And then how would you assess if a given data point is coherent with uh, other data points? Or if not, and probably is an outlier. So maybe it's too easy because it's somehow written on the slides. <laughs> uh, but probably what you just compute the difference, right? Be between the uh, observations, the value of the observations, and the gridded climatology in the mean field, right? And if something is really different from the mean field, then it's probably an outlier, right? So that's what's sometimes called the residual. So the difference between the uh, observations and the uh, and the, and the mean field. And this gives an indication about how bad a given data is. Okay. And, uh, and this is really uh, some of the tests that are done now routinely also with, uh, with various kinds of uh, ocean observations, with satellite observations, in situ observations. But every time a new observation comes by, uh, quite often this observation is first compared to the, uh, to the expected mean at a given location. Maybe you have even the expected standard deviation at a given location. And so you can decide 
uh, in a semis automatic way if this is uh, if this is a suspicious data point or not. Okay. But this should be uh, also um, this should be. Um, can you move? <laughs> But you have to be careful that because you can also flag uh, real events that are just anomalous as bad data. So, for instance, uh, I don't remember the exact, exact year, but there was one El Nino event in the Pacific uh, which was uh, ignored for some time because all the data that was received was flagged as bad. Because it was so different from from the uh, from the mean, from the expected mean state. Okay, so it's uh, it's quite important that, uh, that we also uh, that there's a human in the loop who checks if uh, if this data is is actually valid or not. Okay. Do I have any questions about about outliers? So who who has already seen who worked with in situ data and have a, has a problem with outliers? Yeah, yeah, I, I would expect more hands actually. <laughs> so outliers are really, really common, really, really common. It's really a tough business to go to go to see it, to uh, to collect data, and uh, and having bad data, it's it's really common. And also, even if you don't go yourself and see, but you you are assembling data, large collection of data, and it's uh, uh, having. Um, you, ch you, key, you increase the chances that there are some bad data when you have when you're working with large collections, and even there is just one percent of questionable or one tenth of percent of bad or questionable data, it can still re ruin your analysis. So. And um, so there are different ways to use uh, D V N D. So um, so Diva um, is, a, is an open source tool, which you can just download it from, uh, from uh, GitHub. And we also prepared uh, several examples uh, within uh, Jupyter Notebooks. And, um, and we will also show them later in the uh, CData Cloud VRE. As I already mentioned, uh, if you use uh, the desktop version of ODV, it's also integrated in the backend. And uh, and there is a so what I do sometimes for for students uh, I have a, a very simple web uh, web interface where they have to decide where to put observations. Yeah, assume this is the true field, and you should decide where to put some observations. So you can choose ten observations. You choose a, a length scale. I assume I would take a ridic ridiculously small. Oh no, that's my name, it's Alex. And if I would use a ridiculously small correlation length scale just for, uh, for example, I didn't test it. <laughs> okay, it still works. Okay, so then you can see uh, how well. So if you have these observations, and you put a ridiculously small correlation length scale, you see that you do not propagate information in space at all, okay? So you only have a value close to the uh, interpolated field where you have observations, uh, but everywhere else is just zero, and so uh, you have a really large difference. So if you use a, a better correlation length scale, then you can, uh, can have something more realistic. And so I, just, I use this to entertain my students, um, so they have to... Uh, um, choose well the location of the observation, choose well the parameter, and then here is a ranking of, uh, of those who, who got the best, uh, best reconstruction. Okay. Um, but, yeah, that's just for playing. So for serious work, it's maybe better to use uh, DVND either in the VRE or on our local machine. And this is just an example here of uh, how it's used in production in Emonet's uh, chemistry. This is an example of chlorophyll A uh, analysis where different, uh, different um, 
uh, participating in this project have generated diva analysis and so what what we decided to do in the end we only showing the uh, analyzers where we have uh, uh, high confidence that it is uh, true so it's essentially where we have observations so there are some areas where we don't have observations or not enough observations so per default these uh, these values are not shown but they are still available okay so in our group, we started with actually the tool Diva, which is, uh, so I already mentioned Diva and Diva and D, so you might wondering what's about these different tools. So Diva started as a Fortran tool, maybe now uh, 30 years ago, I guess, or 25 years ago, so well ahead of the, t well before the time of Charles and me. And it is uh, it's a Fortran tool uh, and using uh, shell scripts, so it is, uh, um, it serves the purpose quite well, uh, but we found out it's a bit difficult to uh, um, to use, for instance, on, on Windows platforms. Or and um, so we started to re rewrite Diva in, uh, in Julia, and also making um, getting rid of a limitation of Diva that only works in two-dimensional space. So it can only make a 2D analysis. So typically, if you want to have a, a three-dimensional uh, ocean estimation you would run the 2d analysis for different layers and um, with, with D by D it can work in n dimension and has an extends first the concept of correlation length scale in all uh, in all special and, and temporal dimensions um, so we, we wrote it in, uh, in the programming language Julia and uh, we use this because it has a good trade-off between efficiency so you can write uh, explicit loops for instance and it's, uh, it's still relative quite fast and it's quite flexible similar to other dynamic languages and it makes it quite easy to, uh, to, uh, to make uh, Jupyter notebooks with some, uh, with some example uh, notebook how to use D by D okay, so I'm just wondering, uh, are some of you already familiar with some of, uh, say, uh, programming languages? Maybe like, uh, like MATLAB, uh, yeah? The model? <laughs> yeah? And so, yeah? So, maybe raise your hand who, was, who done already some programming? Okay, so a good share of you. And, um, I'm just wondering what what language do you use? So Julia is a relatively new language, so I'm not sure if anybody actually uh, use it already. So maybe raise your hand if you if you already did some Julia. Okay, <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> and uh, so maybe who who uses R for instance? Okay, a bit more, quite a bit more. Uh, Python. Ah, uh, yeah. Or oh, MATLAB. Okay, um, what else? Java? Okay, still a lot of people using Java. Uh, C, C++? Okay, wow, okay. Okay, great, great. So did I forget any important language? <laughs> okay, so, um, um, so Julia is a language is strongly influenced uh, by uh, by a language like MATLAB, Python, and R, and it uh, takes a bit the uh, advantages of all these uh, different languages. So it uses, uh, um, it strives to be as easy as MATLAB for linear linear algebra, and it uses a lot of modern programming concepts from Python, like uh, like generators and things like this, and, and uh, meta programming aspects. And it still tries to be as efficient as R when it comes to handling data, so manipulating data and using, for instance, data frames. But there are some aspects which are a bit unique, unique to Julia. So it's actually compiled to machine code. It's not an interpreted language. It's really uh, compiled. And so it's compiled down to machine code. And it uh, in, can have a performance which is similar to C. So it's maybe... Uh, uh, so not yeah, it's approaching C, and has some really uh, uh, technical uh, interesting things uh, that I don't think it's really important for for now. But 
Uh, it has really elaborate time system and it's uh, under the hood. It's, uh, it is a bit like, like Lisp, if you have heard about it. So even Julia code itself is a data structure that you can manipulate in Julia. So it's really, you can do really a lot of things with it. And um, so Julia is the uh, underlying base languages and uh, we're using Jupyter Notebooks as the, as the interface which is a uh, quite conveniently already a uh, web, integrated web environment. So it's, it's a good fit to integrate it in the virtual research environment because it already works in a, in a web uh, platform. And then in, in this, um, I'll just show of hands who already use uh, Jupyter Notebooks or IPython Notebooks. Okay, okay. So, um, and it's not, not at all specific to Julia. In fact, it starts at for Python, so it was called IPython before, and uh, um, and uh, uh, at one point the IPython developer want to make it clear it's not just for Python, so they rechanged the name in Jupyter, and Jupyter's effect stands for Jupyter, Python, and R, and uh, and uh, but it's even beyond this. You can do also. Uh, Use other programming environment, other programming languages in, in Jupyter notebooks, like Octave and uh, and even Bash script and things like this. So it is really good at combining these three aspects: so computing and uh, visualization and uh, documentation. So if you have a given workflow which involves doing some computation, visualizing the result, and Let's have a documentation, uh, extensive documentation on what we are doing. Then uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook is a really good fit for it. And even so, that some people are actually claiming that this kind of things might be the new model for scientific articles. Because, yeah, scientific articles, there's always a problem that uh, what you write down is just text and uh, probably equations, figures. But for somebody who reproduces it, it's quite hard, actually. It's not, not easy, and maybe it's not even possible in some cases. So what's actually missing are the, uh, the steps, if you're using, uh, uh, if it's uh, the steps that you came to this, that you lead, that, uh, that you use to lead to this conclusion. So, and sometimes these steps uh, can be expressed as, uh, as some code. And uh, so if you integrated this computing aspect in a, and then you have something which is much easier to, to reproduce. And um, so it really facilitates reproducibility and peer review. So review by, uh, by your colleagues or other scientists. And it's actually quite, uh, um, quite, quite heavily used outside our community. So it's also used in communities like your machine language and even uh, uh, relatively big players like uh, Google or Microsoft uh, offering now uh, services based on Jupyter Notebooks. So if you have actually a, a Google account, there's some, uh, there's a Colab research environment which is actually already avail available to you and it's uh, using Jupyter Notebooks. Okay. So what to think about, uh, so men the mental model somehow um, about Jupyter Notebooks is that you're interacting with a, uh, with a web page and all the computation happen on the server of this web page. Okay, so the data has to be there, uh, um, and um, and the uh, the resources have to be there as well. So, so for somebody who does uh, home office, it's actually quite good fit. So you can sitting on your home in your home and uh, having a good internet connection to the uh, to your uh, employer. And where every data is, uh, is, is there, so it is a good, uh, uh, good model to work with Jupyter Notebooks in, in this sense. So where you have the computation power and the uh, data resources are on your server. So the Jupyter Hub is actually the same thing, but it's uh, meant for multiple users, and that's what we're using here in the VR. And this is a topic which, with uh, a really active development. So there's now also from the same team as Jupyter Lab. It's a more integrated development uh, environment, but it's not, this is not deployed on the uh, CDATANET VRE, but it's uh, also very interesting, uh, but it, I think we, we might do so in the future. 
So here are some overview of what we're doing during the practical uh, session. So we start uh, with the dashboard that you have already seen yesterday. So once you log in, you get this kind of da dashboard. I think you have mostly worked with uh, ODV yesterday, but there was also a button called uh, Jupyter Hub Diva uh, notebooks, and uh, this will allow you to, uh, to spawn a Jupyter uh, Hub instance where all the software that we're uh, speaking about, Diva, is already pre-installed and can, can be used. And also some example notebooks that we will use later. Okay. Uh, so the data in the Jupyter Hub is not uh, um, uh, is not served uh, is not saved permanently. So if you want to uh, uh, to save some data uh, permanently, it's better to transfer it to uh, to the attached Nextcloud instance, or just to download it on your on your on your user desktop. Okay. Um, Okay, well that's not. And so, um, so in conclusions, uh, Diva and Diva ID are both open source software, and uh, actually, I think really all of the software that we're developing is open source, and they are licensed under the GPL. So it's really meant to be reused by um, um, by interested people, scientists, or or uh, data managers. Um, we using uh, we are trying to transition uh, to make DVD easy to use also in the cloud infrastructure so that you don't have to use your own uh, computational power you can of course but if you if you uh, you can also use the one that we provided in uh, in C data cloud on this uh, VAE development and uh, one of the big advantage of Jupyter Notebook for me, I think, it's uh, it allows a quite consistent approach. So Jupyter Notebook is a workflow that can be easily shared, and that's something that was uh, a bit missing, I would say, in the past. That we, uh, it was not so easy to uh, to uh, to standardize on a on a given workflow, and it facilitates uh, reproducibility. So if you're doing something one time, you probably uh, you will need to update it. At a later point, so it's much easier if you have uh, this kind of workflow uh, documented in the notebook. So yeah. Um, so this is just uh, uh, about the organization. So only a subset of the. Uh, uh, so once you connect to the um, uh, to the Jupyter uh, notebook interface. Only a subset of the notebook will be covered. Yeah, so the, these, the notebooks are quite extensive, but we won't have time to go through all of them. And there are in the folder work, Diva and D workshop exercises. Okay. So do not skip and go directly to the uh, exercises directory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so. Uh, Charles will first start to give you some introduction about uh, um, about notebook themselves. So that for this we will create a notebook from scratch, and then we, we will uh, have some notebooks about the general introduction to Julia, how to uh, prepare topography for Julia, how to import data from ODV, and to, to make an analysis. Okay. So these notebooks are in the folder exercises, but the solution of this notebook are in the folder above. Okay, so um, if you are stuck, you can always also look to the to the solutions. Um, and uh, um, and yeah, so but I, I really encourage you to open the notebook in the exercise directory, not directly open the solution notebook. Okay. So, how are we doing on time? So, what questions do you have? I think every row should have le at least ask one question. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have to assume that you're asleep. Ah, okay, great, thank you. <laughs> um, in the demo that you
in the demo that you gave, um, what were you? Can you explain what you were doing and why you were doing that? I mean, you did this um, on, a, on a grid of surfaces at some point, and what was the purpose? So the purpose is, uh, is for students to think about where to sample an oceanographic field. So I assume this is your, your field, yeah? and uh, ocean measurements are expensive. And so and assume you have this kind of field maybe available from a satellite, yeah? but you want to know how is the structure below it. Yeah? And so um, where would you put, say, CTD measurements in order to, uh, uh, to also see what's, what's below the surface? But here, to make simple, what you need to reconstruct based on these uh, on these point measurements is in fact just the um, this just the surface. Does this answer your question? So it's just about think where to put measurements. So and how information is spread. So for instance, a good point where to put measurements would be on the on the local maxima, for instance. Yeah. You have this maxima, this is a good point to, uh, to, put, to put a measurement. Yeah. Because then information will be spread and you will easily uh, reproduce this, uh, this, this, uh, um, this, this maximum which is also in your, in your field. Okay, and also think about not, um, it's not, yeah, of course, you should not cluster the measurements, yeah, if you want to reconstruct the uh, the field over this whole domain, yeah, having all uh, all data in one corner would not be very good. Uh, would not be a, a very efficient approach. But of course, this is in fact how how data are distributed uh, in reality. They tend to cluster it, and yeah, that's uh, that's something um, to take into account. Okay. Okay, next row. <laughs> or oh, any other row? So who of you works with, say, with, uh, with temperature or salinity data, with physical data? Who works with physical ocean data? Okay, okay. And do you typically have uh, um, station data or do you have... Uh, well, can it be said that do, uh, do you collect data over a given region or maybe you just have just a particular time series? So if you have just a particular time series, then indeed it's, uh, that's not, not too, uh, uh, too, too useful uh, to use DIVA for this. Uh, but uh, but it could still be useful to, uh, to, have a, uh, to collect data from other uh, data sources and to have a kind of map of the environment, I would guess. Um, so who of you maybe see a, a potential use case? Of Diva in this, in this, in this uh, for this application. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, um, do you have any other questions? Okay. So I'm sure when we go to the exercise, there will be a lot of questions. <laughs> so. Um, um, so. Shall we make make the introduction to uh, the notebooks, Charles? No, uh, yeah, I think, uh... So, shall we do the overall presentation of the notebooks? Yeah. yeah? Hello. Uh, so now uh, we have a competition, but uh, it's not official. It was the the idea of uh, crashing the VRE the, in the last time, but we want, don't want to do it now because uh, it's easy to crash. Maybe if we ask everybody to connect to the VRE and run a notebook, it will it will crash. So please, 
Now what we will do is do real exercise, so we'll have to type comments and you will do it by group. So we will ask maybe one out of four persons to do it. So it means each row on each side will open it, not everybody, but we will monitor it. Uh, we, we know what you are doing and if you, but yeah, it, would be, it won't be so fun if you do it like now, it's not even 10. Maybe later in the afternoon, we can say, okay, let's, let's try to do it. So you remember the address? I never remember, so I wrote it. Uh, orca dkrz.de. HTTPS, of course, of course. Mm -hmm. Like this. You have the famous uh, Marine ID login. So again, I have to, to watch because I never remember my Marine ID. So I am Charles Trupin, if you don't know. And my Marine ID is, oh, I cannot say it. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's difficult. Yeah, yeah, accept, I think. But normally for you, if you did it yesterday, I think it will work directly. Oh, I'm already in. So you remember everything for yesterday because it was just a few hours ago. So we have your private workspace. When you, for the first time, if you remember, it will take a while. But you have to do it because it will mount, it will able, enable you to get access to your workspace. You can do it now just to see if it quicks or not. If it takes a few minutes, no problem. And then you have, if you remember, all the ODV stuff, which is here, import, etc. And then what we will do all together is to go to the Diva Jupyter Notebook. So you can do it and you click. What's happening now in the background is that we will run a Jupyter Hub. Uh, it's very, very small. And so I will do uh, exactly command plus, like, uh, thing like, no, like. Command minus. Like this, I think it's it's clear. So it, this is where you are. You have a work directory. You go inside. And here, as Alexander just told you, in the Diva ND workshop, you have a lot of stuff. It is what we provide to the user to use Diva, Diva ND. We, we, we thought the best way to use uh, Diva ND is to provide example that people can then uh, customize, use for their own uh, region, and to provide the results. So, all the, uh, the notebooks that you can see here below, they are uh, created for the people uh, dealing with climatology. So we have step-by-step -step introduction, what is a notebook, what is Julia, how to open a NetCDF, etc. It goes uh, more and more difficult from the one to the number uh, 90, which is the full analysis. So you must also realize that when we do a DIVA uh, training course, we use four full days and uh, today we'll do it in uh, four hours maybe so it's difficult so it, if it fails let's say it's our fault it means we did not explain well if if it works if you succeed all it means you are great and we are very happy so you will we'll try to do that so why we use the vre there are two main reasons when we install diva we notice there are two big problems for the people to use it first is the installation Installation is painful. It can take half a day because yeah, before the front run you had to compile have the good the native library. It was a mess. We improved that with Julia, but still the installation is not easy. And the second difficulty is the computing resource that you have on your machine. Sometimes people complain and say, yeah, "Look, I try your example, but my machine is not good enough. I cannot do it." So with the VRE is good because you just have to log in. You don't install anything, and you have the computing resource and you have the code already installed. So it means for us it's great. So if you can follow and go to the exercise uh, here, and we have a folder with the four notebooks that we will present today. The first thing I have to do is to explain you what is a notebook. So how do we start? So please follow, you have the new notebook. I will click on Julia 1.1.1. So tell me if it's not okay. If it's not okay, you raise your hand. So this is a notebook. A notebook, uh, in this case, a Jupyter notebook, is a web interface to a document. It is document. The notebook is a mix of different cells. Here, I am in a, in a cell. 
you have different type of cell and the type of the cell is written here you see code I have different types I have code markdown which is simply text or raw and be convert we won't use it but it, it will be used if you want to convert this notebook to another format we don't need it and heading is a way of uh, putting titles subtitles etc so the first thing you have to do usually the notebook when you create it it's called untitled you will put the title I will uh, be very original I will put it my first uh, notebook but you can you can put something more more clever and if we go back here you will see it now appears in the list my first notebook is in the list and you see green which means it's active the kernel the Jula kernel is working so we will start with a simple uh, markdown and uh, I will uh, no, I will put a, a title. I will put heading. This is a level two heading. Is there? I will put a, a introduction. So basically, you have to consider that uh, the uh, no notebook will be a documentation of a workflow. You will be a lot of text, and this text will explain what you are doing, why you do it, and uh, what the, are the results you obtain. Because it's really the idea that this document is self-contained. You have the code, but the code itself, if you give it to somebody else, maybe that person doesn't understand anything because it's not documented. So it's a way to have different cell documenting and then running and running the code uh, bit by bit. So for example, here I have a cell which I will select as a code and I will put, I don't know, uh, my name and I will create a string and a charge. To run uh, a cell, you have this button, you can run. So when you see it's running, it has this small star in the in the bracket. And when it's run, you have a number, which is one in this case, which puts the order of execution. So if I put here a uh, number equal uh, 6.23, you will see I have number two, because it's executed uh, after, after it. But I can also re-execute this one and get three. Okay. So it's always good to, to put more explanation so I can create a new cell with the plus. The plus create a cell. If you want to re re remove one, use the scissor. It's, I think it's quite explicit. But you can also use the edit where you have all the comments. Cut, copy, delete. It's also useful sometimes to move a cell above and below to deplace them inside the notebook because you want to rearrange the order to have a, a whole story because at the end what you want to get it's what they call a data storytelling. You want to tell what you do to get from the data to the result. So uh, so to run a cell uh, let's say type uh, control, no, it's a shift, press enter, shift, press enter, so you see here it's a code, see if I run it, so I do shift, enter, it failed, because in fact it was not code, it was a uh, markdown, so it's okay, I change it, markdown, I run it, okay. So it's very, what we are doing now uh, in the next notebooks that we will present is playing with notebooks that are already pre-filled. So that you have al already some, some exercise, some text, and then you have to continue to fill, uh, to fill some, some empty cells and to, yeah, to do the exercise. Uh, what's good with the notebook, we like it because it's, uh, yeah, you can explain everything what you are doing, but you can also export it in different formats. For example, I say, okay, download as I want to get it as a LaTeX file, for example. It can be used because you say, okay, my notebook is almost close to the paper I want to publish. So let's just export the notebook into LaTeX, edit the LaTeX and generate the final paper, why not? Or you can create a HTML page. In fact, it's very easy to generate from a notebook a HTML presentation to do that, but it's uh, not something we'll use today. In the cell, you have a cell type. So you have this type, okay. And in the other, it's, uh, where is it, this one? Yeah, the cell toolbar. Inside the view, you have a cell toolbar, you have the slideshow. If you click on that, you have new buttons and each, each cell can have a different type. So you can say this cell contains text, but I want it to be a slide. This one, I want it to be a sub-slide, etc. And from that, uh, you can generate a presentation. But again, it's a detail we want uh, show that today but you need to know that 
From the notebook, you can get a PDF, a LaTeX file, another presentation, a Julia file, everything. It's very uh, powerful and that's why we like it. Yeah. Exactly. Now, when you want to know the language you are using, it's written here, Julia 1.1. If you install or you machine the Jupyter, you can install any language you want. In my case, in my machine at home, I have uh, Python 3, Python 2, Julia 1, uh, JavaScript. You can almost any language as a kernel. And if you want to change it, you go to kernel, change kernel. And in this case, of course, in the VRE, we only installed uh, Julia because we are working with it. But you can imagine, here in the list, you might get 10 items you change. But here we are, uh, we are doing uh, Julia. So I don't know if I have to say much more about that. So yeah, when we work with the people creating the climatology, the typical email we send is, please send me your notebook. It's really the thing that helps us to solve the problems because it contains everything, the data they are using, what they're doing, it can help them uh, correct. So that's why we, we, we use it. So we. This one is not a real exercise. I just invite you to type a few commands, run them, try to get some errors. Like if you put some uh, text and you select it as a code, you will see it will it will fail. And uh, in let's say five five minutes, Alexander will uh, give you a first introduction to to the to the Julia language because it's new for let's say for us. It's not so new, but it's a new language. And most of you haven't used it, so that's what we can we can do now. No, the, the, within the notebook, the scope is global. So it's not cell by cell. But it's different in the, in the Julia code. But in this case, yeah, the scope is global. So now we make a brief introduction to the Julia programming language. Not much, just enough to uh, um, to know to use the uh, D and D notebooks later on. Okay. So for this, we will open um, the notebook which called zero um, zero two zero two uh, Julia introduction. So you just click on it, and you will have. This uh, this page, this tab in your web browser appearing. Okay. So if for some reason you are you are stuck, you don't see what I'm seeing, or you're having an error message, so please raise your hand and we will have a look at it. Okay. So if everybody is at this stage, um, so this is a um, so as Charles mentioned, uh, in order to uh, define a variable, you just give it a value. Okay. So if I want to define a variable. Which called uh, uh, which called city with the value ostend, then we just run city equal ostend. Okay, and so the type of a variable is given once you give it the value. So if we have a look at the type, it's it's a it's, it's a string string that's um, for computer a string is uh, is uh, a text text yeah. A string of characters, <clears throat> and if you uh, instead of working with one just one string, but several strings, like here a list of countries: Germany, Netherlands, Italy, Belgium. You will just enclose it as uh, um, in uh, square brackets and commas. Yeah? So in order to execute all this cell. You can tie. You can hit uh, Shift Enter or Control Enter, or you just use it here uh, with Run. Yeah. Okay. So what is interesting about uh, 
about Julia is that it can infer the type uh, by its value. For instance, uh, here it sees that all of these elements are strings, so the result is an array of strings. Yeah? And in other languages, uh, that would just be a list of something. And you don't know exactly what the something is unless you, uh, you, uh, you index it. Okay. Okay, so type of countries is then an array of strings. Okay. There are other data structures which are quite useful, which are called dictionaries, just like in Python, or in some language they're called hash map. So instead of an array is just an association between an index value and a, and a value and a, and a variable. Yeah. But sometimes it's a bit inconvenient to use uh, uh, an index to reference uh, a value. Sometimes easier to use, uh, um, for instance, a string. Yeah? So here, assume that you want to create a dictionary. Yeah? So the name dictionary really comes from dictionary as we're used to it. So dictionary is a way to look up the definition of a given term. So you have an alphabetic list of terms and then attached to each term is its definition. So that's really the basic, the, um, the, uh, the basic idea of dictionaries in Julia and in Python, by the way, as well. So, huh. um, so assume that we want to create a dictionary and associate to, uh, to different entries in this dictionary a given value. Yeah? So here, let's try a dictionary um, with the uh, coastline of uh, some European countries. So of course, we, knew, we need to make a Google search of it. I don't remember it by heart, but it was quite amazed to hear that uh, Norway is in fact the uh, worldwide the second country with the longest shoreline. So the first one was Canada, but uh, on the second spot it was Norway. And it was, yeah, the complex, the topography, the uh, shoreline of Norway is really complex and have a lot of islands. And thanks to all these islands, uh, Norway has the second spot in the longest uh, shoreline. How do you calculate the shoreline? <laughs> calculate the shoreline? Uh, well, it's... Um, you, you are question why, why it's because it's fractal or something? What? Your, your question... Uh, yeah. Yeah, you, you have to you have to stick at the given resolution, of course. So, and it, it is a, it's an interesting research question because uh, shorelines tend to be fractal, right? So you have base, base, base and base, base and base, and so on. And so, uh, if uh, if you would count all these little uh, base, then it's yeah, it might not be a finite number. <laughs> um, but for here, this was just the idea was just to look it up somewhere. You don't have to compute it yourself. So, huh. And let's say Belgium. Huh. So, I probably should know, but maybe yeah, my, my colleague from Bliss knew it. 67. Ah. Uh, 60, just 67 kilometers, yeah? yeah. <laughs> too bad, too bad, okay. <laughs> okay, so, um, so this is uh, uh, a dictionary with uh, uh, entries are strings. Here's a string Norway, so or the string Belgium, and associated to them are values. And you see here, uh, this association is marked with this, uh, this equal, this kind of error. Yeah? This uh, marks association. Okay. So this is how you get data into a dictionary. And to get data out of the dictionary,
I'm trying to find my way here on the Mac keyboard. I don't find square brackets. I'm looking for square brackets. So how do you make a square bracket on a, on a Mac keyboard? You have to copy and paste. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Command copy. Oh. Command paste. Uh. Co yeah, but the square brackets. What's the square the square brackets? Come and see. Come and see. So okay. very different from you. Okay. Ah, that would be great. That would be great. Okay. Oof, I got it. <laughs> so, in order to get a value out of uh, out of a dictionary, you use a square bracket. Yeah. And I can do the same thing. Come and see. Sorry. Uh, I didn't see the number one in the input. Just a question. Uh, how do you put the number one in the input line of the code line? I just added a new... Ah, no, I did it by accident. I did it by accident in looking for... Uh, uh, while looking for... Uh, yeah, it is... If you put escape L, it puts a line number. So this is useful if you have... Uh, uh, cells can, can contain much more code than just one, one line. So if you have a cell with 10 lines, and you have an error, it will tell you at which line there's an error. And then it's useful to know, okay, which line is the seventh line of 10. So you can with escape L, activate it, and escape L, deactivate it. So, and if you want, if you want to get a individual value out of uh, out of uh, a list of countries, say if you want to have the first country in my list, it was just country one. Okay. So unless unless Python, it's uh, indices start as one. Okay. But it's quite similar with dictionaries and arrays. Okay. Exactly. That's that's uh, uh, that's uh, dictionaries have no order. Yeah. It's just an association between value and pair. That's uh, so. Um, so. I think you could you could easily have here. Huh. You could you could also have something like this. So you could even have uh, 
numbers and uh, and strings mixed. Okay. Okay. So, um, any other questions about dictionaries and arrays? So now let's ramp it up. Let's uh, try to define some functions. But really, for those who are really new to programming, it's pretty normal to have a lot of questions at this stage. So really, don't be shy to ask them, because it's really, really normal. And um, and so, yeah, we are, we are Charlie is here to, uh, to go around. Uh, so if you don't want to ask a question to the whole audience, you can also ask it to Charles or, or me when I'm, when I'm uh, going here around. So now for the next, next thing is to, uh, uh, to define a simple function. And uh, let's try to, to implement this equation, which computes the, uh, the density based on temperature and salinity. So as we know, if temperature increases, density goes up or down? Goes down, right? I hear it. And if uh, uh, and so therefore we have a minus sign here. Yeah. If temperature increases, density goes down. If salinity increases, density goes up. Right, exactly. So we have a plus sign here. So this is essentially just a linearization of the uh, of the uh, state equation of density. Okay, density is a function of temperature salinity, and the idea is now to implement this uh, this uh, um, this equation. Okay. Um, and so some things you have maybe noticed. is that uh, we're using sometimes, uh, here I sometimes use the Greek characters, like the Greek character row. And so one way to, to write it, you don't have to use Greek characters, you can just use the row or density, whatever you want. But if you want to introduce a Greek character, uh, you start it with a backslash type uh, row in uh, Latin letters, and then hit tab two times, I think, and then it gets transferred to row. But we don't have to worry about this. We can just write row here to make it simple. Okay. Okay. So now the little exercise that we have now for you is try to implement this equation yeah, that we have here. In Julia, using these constants here, so that the so that you can compute density based on temperature and salinity. Okay. So the first thing here was to transcribe all these uh, these equations. And something I have to say also is that, for instance. Uh, um, this means 10, uh, 10.7 times 10 to minus 4. Yeah? So you could you write it if you want. Uh, like this, I guess. Or you can also write it what's sometimes called the engineering notation. Okay, yeah. So this this would be the parameter alpha, for instance. So I can write it. So that would be one one value to put it here. The exercise is to implement the function just before coffee break, so let's try to do it in less than 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah, so the reward would be coffee. <laughs>
Okay. And if you are stuck for any reason, please raise your hands. Don't lose out your coffee because you were stuck on writing a, a, a program. Yeah? How can I locate the column number 14? So I have a, an error. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to run the, the function and I have an error and it says like invalid character, whatever, near column 14. So how do I locate the column 14? Ah, uh, the column 14, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so line numbers you can easily locate them, but column numbers 14. Mm. But if, if you know already the line number, then uh, yeah, the minus. Yeah, yeah. ah yeah 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 better not copy and paste it, but uh, rewrite it. Uh. Copy paste the formula which is in the previous cell inside the function. It will say the person character and not the, the proper minus one and not the minus. It's not a good one. So if you type it down. And once you have the function implemented, you have to test it. So you use a pair of temperatures and unity values to check if the density is what you expect. So if you get a good order of magnitude, so always test your function.
So shall we have a look? All right. Who is still uh, working on this exercise? So, so here's one way to do it. Um, you define inside the function compute density, the constants, rho, zero, t, zero, s, zero, alpha, beta, and then compute rho using, uh, using the function above. Okay. Now, um, the, uh, uh, in the equation that we are um, Square brackets, so in the mathematical notation we sometimes use square brackets if they are nested, nested brackets, but when you translate them to code you have to use uh, normal brackets. Okay. And also make sure that the minus sign is a simple minus sign and not a, not a special uh, uh, Unicode character. Okay. So. Anybody was able to do something like this? Yeah, or anybody else? Yeah, have a question? Oh, you were able to do it. Great, thanks. Thanks for confirming. <laughs> um, or anybody has a question? Uh, so then, of course, uh, we should test our function. The bare minimum to test to do would be, would be to test it for the reference value. So we say for the reference value 10, 10 degrees Celsius, 35 PSU, we should have a, a density of 1,028 kilograms per meter square, per meter cube, sorry. Uh, and if you, if you run it, we have indeed the, uh, the reference value. Okay. So I delete this cell. Okay. So the last... Uh, things that we can do. So here, here Charles proposed to look about the number of days since the Titanic accident. I propose just to look the number of days to your next birthday or your significant uh, other birthday, so you know how many, how much time you, that you have. So uh, so for instance um, so the birthday of my wife is the eleventh uh, September. Okay. Okay. I have to first import the module days. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I date without s. And I want to compute how much time. I still have to get her a nice present, okay? And um, <clears throat> um, so that's the date. There's also the function today. If I'm, if I'm lazy, I don't want to think about what day we have today. So we can just use the comment today. Yeah. So. Uh, 20th June, that's correct, okay. And now the interesting thing about dates that you can do ar arithmetic about, uh, about them. So you can just, you can just make a, a difference between two dates and it will tell you um, the um, the difference in in, in uh, days, yeah. So this is a, a particular type. It's a type which has the, its units attached to it, yeah. So if we call this variable t, let's have a look of type of t. 
two. It is a its type is day. Okay, but if I simply want to get the uh, the value without its units, then I have to use dates dot value of t. Okay, so if you want to strip off the units, so typically that's what you want to do when you want to use this value later for doing some computation. You want to strip off its units and treat it as a normal number. Okay. So, who of you is more in a hurry than I am to get a birthday present? So, who has less than 83? How much do you have? 36. 26, okay, okay. Uh, Belgium chocolate are always a good, uh, a good idea. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, and often we want to also use uh, hours, minutes, and seconds in addition to to just the date, yeah. Um, and for this, the uh, the value is called daytime, yeah. Uh, Okay. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay. So this would be the last second of this year. Um, if you want to add uh, also hours, minutes, seconds, you would rather use the uh, um, the structure daytime, and that's typically what we use for ocean data. It's not sufficient to just know when it was uh, taken the data, but also you want to have some information about the hour and minute, seconds maybe not, but um, not necessarily. But it's uh, yeah, that's typically used for uh, use daytime for this. And you can use the same thing for daytime. You can also add uh, uh, add one day, subtract one day, or or computing the difference between two two dates using daytime. Okay. Questions? Yeah? Ah, that's a very good question. So, um, so the time zone, it's, uh, um, it's essentially unaware of a time zone. So, essentially, I treat it always as uh, UTC. Yeah? And... Um, so UTC without daylight saving time. Yeah. Okay. Is there any uh, library for something like that that can extract like one of these functions that can deal with this kind of thing? Uh, with uh, uh, time zones? Calendar, time zone, calculation, calculation. Is there any, any uh, kind of library? Uh, so, the Julia language has itself a standard library. So, for instance, the module, module dates is already uh, uh, in the standard library of Julia. So, it has already quite, quite extensive support for daytimes, but actually not for time zones, but it has quite, quite extensive support for, for this. Uh, but there are other um, um, modules in the wider Julia ecosystem which uh, uh, work with uh, work with dates and uh, yeah uh, recently we made one uh, for for netcdf files because in netcdf files unfortunately some people use uh, um, um, calendars like uh, pretending the year is always uh, 360 days long and so things like this so there are some some uh, libraries which allow you to deal with this kind of dates yeah. Okay, any other questions? <laughs>